Hello, Michael over here again uh, with another lecture on Works and Creek by Margaret Atwood. Um, again, intended for my um, English 102 students, but really for anybody who is um, hoping to kind of dig into this book a little bit deeper. So we're going to start this lecture with Chapter 7 uh, in the section called Sveltana. Uh, Snowman wakes up. He's uh, hungover from the night before, again, from his overindulgence. Um, his sort of way of self-medicating, dealing with his present scenario. Um, he says, uh, tomorrow is another day. Now, uh, I think that that kind of, again, goes back to this sort of tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow idea um, that we've seen previously. Um, he kind of goes through some observations. Um, he says, I used to be erudite. Um, he used to know big words. He used to kind of have this knowledge. Um, Again, being uh, a words guy. Uh, he eats the Sveltana cocktail sausages. Um, and we get a little bit of information about the fruit that he got uh, previously from Fruits of the World. Um, and then we get, I think, most importantly, um, that he's going to retrace his steps to the re rejuvenescence compound. He's going to get some supplies. Um, and we get this sort of the first big inf um, introduction to paradise. This paradise was what they named the place. He'd been one of the angels guarding the gate in a manner of speaking, so he knows where everything is. He'll be able to lay his hands on the necessary items. So that's page 151. So again, um, paradise is misspelled probably, um, well, not probably, definitely intentionally, um, probably as a branding thing. Um, and him being an angel at the gate, this sort of guardian is um, worth paying attention to. And it's not necessarily a literal role so much as a metaphorical one. Um, so he decides that he's going to go. He's going to have to tell the children of Craig that he's going. Um, uh, it says page 153 he doesn't want to discover he's them to discover he's missing and set out looking for him they could run into dangers or get lost uh, so again you know this idea of his responsibility or culpability um, looking over them maybe again much like a parent as we've talked about before and, and discussed in class um, on to the next one um, purring uh, which we get a few interesting things um, the main thing here is, again, uh, rituals. Um, the men uh, pee in a circle twice a day. Uh, Craig has imbued them with this scent that will keep out the, um, the wool bogs and pagoons and other creatures. Um, and it's the one real job that the men have. Um, we also get here this... On page 155, uh, this exchange with Abraham Lincoln, the, the Quaker named Abraham Lincoln. Welcome, O Snowman, says the one called Abraham Lincoln. Will you join us inside our home? He's getting to be a bit of a leader, that one. Watch out for leaders, Craig used to say. First the leaders and the lead, then the tyrants and the slaves, then the massacres. That's how it's always gone. So again, sort of seeing this progression, again, you know, something perhaps Craig hadn't intended or anticipated. Um, we also learn that one of the children has been bitten um, by a bob kitten, a child of Oryx, um, and about this, you know, with a purring ritual that is a healing ritual or uh, uh, the, the, a healing activity. The, the purring is an ultrasonic vibration. Craig worked really hard to, you know, sort of in, make this work for the Craker so that they could heal themselves. We also get a big uh, sort of uh, commentary on religion. Uh, page 157 says um, that the women are going to commune with Ulrich and, and ask uh, for her protection, uh, commune with her, trying to figure out, uh, apologize to uh, Ulrich for having thrown rocks at this bob kitten. Uh, and it says, uh, again, page 157, he's never seen the women do this. This communion with Oryx, although they refer to it frequently, what form does it take? Uh, a little bit further down, it says, Craig thought he'd done away with all that, eliminated what he called the G-spot in the brain. God is a cluster of neurons. 
Um, but it sounds like the Quakers are sort of naturally moving towards a type of religion. And, and again, Snowman has become a part of their cosmogony or their mythical background, giving them Crake, giving them Oryx, um, giving them some uh, origin myths. Um, again, they ask if he's going to see Crake. He says that's what he's going to do, but that they can't come with him. Um, again, operating on this sort of division of um, almost a religion, right? Um, and then, interestingly, we end with uh, another reference to his father, page 162. Snot, Stop sniveling, son, says his father's voice. Pull yourself together. You're the man around here. Right, Snowman yells. What exactly would you suggest? You were such a great example. So again, they get this sort of parental um, uh, parent-child relationship and setting an example, right? Okay, um, so the section that begins blue uh, in Chapter 7, um, kind of an amusing section, right? Um, we learn that the Krakers have been further improved via the mating cycle, um, present... Um, that they uh, have this, they, they mate in cycles every three years or so, as we see present in other mammals. And Crick has sort of done this in order to um, subvert um, all of what he sees as the negative, are the negatives that uh, go along with um, sexuality, right? Um, and there's a debate uh, that goes from page 167 to one, or 166 to 167, rather where Craig starts, how much misery, how much needless despair has been caused by a series of biological mismatches, a misalignment of the hormones or pheromones resulting in the fact that the one you love so passionately won't or can't love you. So he's sort of, uh, you know, Craig, again, this guy that's distant is and, and never really uh, romantically engaged is sort of saying, well, it's the whole romantic act and the sexuality that goes along with it is silly and and not only silly that it's caused all these bad things. Uh, so he's this is his solution that there will be these cycles, um, and there will be no pair bonding, um, and and you know sort of uh, that will take care of it. Um, Jimmy, of course, uh, brings up the idea that right uh, it has it's been an inspiration. He says at the bottom of one sixty six. Uh, Think of the, all the poetry, think Petrarch, think John Donne, think the Vita Nueva. I mean, these are, you know, it's legitimate that he says art is created sort of through the idea of romance and hope and love. Um, and all of that is sort of related, right? Um, Craig dismisses it and, and brings up this idea of frogs that will sort of amplify their voice in order to find a mate. And he says, that essentially, all art is uh, sort of amounts to humans uh, trying to uh, amplify themselves, right? He says, that's what art is for the artist, an empty drain pipe, an amplifier, a stab at getting laid. To which Jimmy responds, your analogy falls down when it comes to female artists. Um, and Craig says that female artists are biologically confused. Um, many of us may have trouble with, uh, with Craig's reasoning, sort of, uh, diminishing art to a sort of just this attempt, uh, you know, essentially to get laid to, um, ha have or find a romantic connection. Uh, so it's, again, this sort of blood and roses, what is he going to sacrifice? So he's going to sacrifice romantic connection in order to, um, you know, uh, have, uh, less war, right? So, um, you can get rid of romantic connection and less war and less war at the cost of art, song, music, all that stuff. Um, okay. So moving on, um, we'll go ahead and move on to the next, uh, chapter, um, chapter eight, which begins with so yummy. So the check, uh, the section so yummy is their graduation from Healthwiser. Bunch of interesting things here. It says, even early February was pushing it. They ducked a twister by one day. So again, this um, idea here, it's warm uh, and, and the seasons have been messed up. I think this really is um, 
uh, would may, indicating to us that global warming is really taking a toll. And we'll see that a, a little bit later, we'll see some more evidence of that. What I find interesting here is um, on page 173 at the bottom, it says Craig was top of class, not a surprise, right? Uh, the bidding for him by the rival edu compounds at the student auction was brisk. So we also learned something about the sort of, there's a draft nature to this, like we have in sports, where the best students are actually drafted or chosen or auctioned uh, to go to different colleges. Um, again, this has to do with the monetization of education, of, um, you know, these compounds being run by big business. Uh, he sent to Watson Crick, that is, is sent to Watson Crick Institute, Watson Crick being uh, a reference to the folks who discovered DNA. Um, Craig has helped Jimmy study uh, for his exams, and even so, he's ended up just a mid-range student. Again, this division between numbers and words people. Um, towards the end of that section, um, I guess so we can we can back up a second. Uh, Jimmy is sent to Martha Graham Academy. So another very very clear delineation. Watson Crick Science Math. That's where Crick is sent. Martha Graham is basically an arts college named after the modern dance uh, dancer and um, choreographer Martha Graham. Totally creative person, and this is a, a reference to again that the separation. This is art, and we'll see that again. So that's where he's going, and it's considered a sort of a subpar school, probably mostly because art is not the thing that makes money. It's not lucrative in this particular society. Um, we also find out that Jimmy's father has divorced his mother in absentia for desertion, and there's a wedding, and it says on 175, at the wedding, Jimmy got as drunk as it took, um, and no surprise, it's Craig that sort of takes him back to his room and, and situates him. So we, we see this again, this relationship between Craig and Jimmy forming where uh, Jimmy's really just taken care of, or sorry, Craig is just taking care of Jimmy um, and looking after him. And understandably, also this frustration of parental roles that's also followed on this sort of reminder of what's, um, what has value in this, this society. So, moving on, um, we're going to go to Happy Kappa, which is the next section. Um, this is following the graduation ceremony. Um, Jimmy uh, is uh, invited by Craig to go to um, a resort at Missoni. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, um, which is on Hudson Bay. It's considered kind of the gateway to the Arctic, but again, another indication, clear indication, I think, of global warming. Um, they're there with Uncle Pete, of course, Jimmy's stepfather. Um, there, we, they watch the Happy Couple riots where we see, you know, again, things getting worse. Um, there are riots um, uh, sort of against the sort of genetically modified coffee beans that are putting everybody else out of business. Um, there's even a reference to Happy Cuppa. Um, employees are being um, assaulted and killed. Um, so we see how violent this is actually getting. This isn't just riots. This is actually full-scale violence. At, at well, watching these um, the coverage, I guess, which is you know what they're interested in. I guess it's all that's on TV. They can't really escape it. Um, is um, couple things. One is that Craig says um, there aren't any sides. And I think this is another big indication that Craig doesn't really see it as good versus evil. He doesn't see humankind as good versus evil. I think we're beginning to see that he just sees all humankind as um, sort of a virus or a plague. Um, we can talk more about that as well. Um, the one thing that they do see on the TV is they catch a glimpse of Jimmy's mother at the protest. Very, very clear. Um, not only does Jimmy notice it, but Craig notices it. Um, and it's very, very, very clear. Um, 
Following that, we get another sort of unique insight into the relationship between Jimmy and Craig, where Craig offers up, um, after all this time of being sort of uh, mum on the topic, the, the information what happened to his dad. And his dad was, um, you know, as he puts it, he was his father was executed, pushed off a plebeland overpass. Um, and all he really says is... Um, Jimmy says, you got you get along with him? This is page 183. And Craig paused. He taught me to play chess before it happened. So again, this chess part, and I think this is going to become very, very important later on to sort of figuring out some of the complexity of what's going on in this story. So we'll definitely keep an eye on that. Uh, we know that um, chess comes up again and again. And if we needed another hint as to how important it was, on the very next page, after a little time break, as we come back to Snowman's present, uh, snowman thinks, how could I have missed it? What he was telling me, how could I have been so stupid, right? He's starting to put the pieces together after the fact, right? Uh, okay, on to applied rhetoric, um, the next section. Um, we learn about the dilapidated conditions at Martha Graham, Macbeth, makes another appearance uh, on page 187, um, followed by a uh, reference to Pride and Prejudice, which again is, for those of you that are familiar, um, or those of you that are not familiar, I should say, uh, about wealth, class, privilege, marriage, relationships, right? So all of these come into play in Pride and Prejudice. Another reference to, to the um, epigraph, to the lighthouse, right? And a reference to the Maltese falcon, which is a interesting reference and again I think intentional um, a film in which there is a you know in the in the end we learn that this the whole thing has been kind of a fake or a ruse interestingly um, the at Martha Graham the uh, on page 188 we learn that the Latin uh, motto the original Latin motto um, for the institution is Ars Longa Vita Brevis, which translates to Art is Long, Life is Short, and it's from uh, Hippocrates, right? Uh, so Hippocratic Oath, you can think, Ethics. Um, the whole quote uh, is something like, Art is Long, Life is Short, Opportunity is Fleeting, Exper uh, Experimentations Perilous, and Judgment Difficult. Now, if that doesn't sort of sound like an encapsulation of what we're talking about here. Um, I don't know what does. Um, even if we need more than that, um, underneath this sort of noble quote from Hippocrates is the newer version that just says, our students graduate with employable skills. I mean, that, again, that's the monetization. It's sacrificing value and ethics for money. Um, He's very, Jimmy is very aware that this is, he's going to be what he calls a, a window, window dressing is what he's going to do. He's just going to be basically writing ad copy. Um, he has uh, some uh, interesting interactions, I think, in this chapter, unless I'm wrong, with his roommate, Bernice. Right. Uh, who uh, burns his sandals because she thinks they're leather, they're actually imitation leather, leather, and then she burns all his jockey shorts because of her views on consensual sex, um, and he eventually gets a room of his own. Um, okay, so, moving on. Asperger's U is the next one. Uh, so, here, I, we're, we're kind of seeing the, the flip side of the coin, right? Um, we have Jimmy and Craig corresponding via email. Um, they're they're distant, but um, Craig. We find out Craig is working harder. It's very uh, competitive at Watson Crick. He says it's. Um, it's also called Asperger's U because, and this is page 193, because of the high percentage of brilliant weirdos that strolled and hopped and lurched through the corridors, 
Semi-autistic, genetically speaking, single-track tunnel vision minds, a marked degree of social ineptitude. These were not your sharp dressers, and luckily for everyone, there was a high tolerance for mildly deviant public behavior. So, following this, we get the idea of the neurotypical, and a neurotypical in Craig's world is, is basically Jimmy. He says, it's everything but the genius gene. Uh, so... Jimmy finishes his term papers. We get um, the information that he's doing all this research on self-help books, and we can see this sort of pervade throughout the first part of this, um, where he's got there's a sort of optimism uh, or, or sort of new age optimism to it, um, and it's it's kind of the thing that catapults Jimmy into the future part of his um, his career, right before uh, before long. Uh, he takes the train, the bullet train, to from Martha Graham to Watson Crick. He views the plea lands outside. Again, we see that class distinction, which we'll see again here in a minute. He's questioned by the corpse of corpse folks. Um, and at the end, page 198, here's our reference to uh, social uh, classes after um, interrogating uh, Jimmy as to his purpose at Watson Crick, the corpse of corpse. Uh, quote, made a phone a cell call as if they hadn't quite believed him. What was a serf like him doing visiting the nobility? Uh, so there you go again, right? Uh, royalty, social classes, nobility. Who are the nobility? They're the ones that have the money um, and the edu compound that is where the, uh, the wealthy elite are going to be. Craig shows up uh, looking thinner and smarter than ever. Um, and there we go. Um, moving on, just because this one actually uh, flows quite well into the next one, Wolvogs, this is a huge um, sort of tour of uh, the Watson Crick compound, and we learn all of what's possible here, which seems to be absolutely anything and everything. Um, we get a biblical reference on page 200. Um, the... Uh, neo-geological rock that absorbs water and uh, when you need water um, you uh, it will release it and then working titles just hit it with a rod which is a reference to Moses um, I believe numbers is the part of the Bible um, and it has something to do with uh, and forgive me I'm not up on my Bible as well as some folks might be that um, Moses was told to talk to the rock but he hit it with his rod instead and sort of incurred the wrath of God from that, um, sort of not following instructions, right? More discussion of what's real and what's fake, um, and real, um, create contents is sort of just the uh, manner of perspective. You know, once it exists, then it is real. That is the new real, right? Um, so the tour around, we get, um, some of the various things are working on, like wallpaper that can change color to match your mood. Um, the whole thing kind of ends up freaking um, Jimmy out because it's too much like Healthwiser. It's too much what he grew up with. It's too much like the Pagoons. Um, we learn how smart the people are there, and again, we see poor Jimmy way... Um, uh, way out of his depth, a huge a total outsider here in this community doesn't know how to work or communicate with these people, which I think is sort of perpetually ironic in a book where he's a words guy, but he cannot communicate basically to save his life. I mean, it, that's a little bit of an extreme because it kind of does save his life, as we'll see. Um, we get about the Wolvogs. And here's importantly, if you turn to page 206, the end of that, they've looked at the chicky knobs. Chicky knobs freak him out too. Weird thing, he says, it seems like it would be like eating a warp. 206, he says, why is it that he feels some line has been crossed, some boundary transgressed? How much is too much? How far is too far? Right? Jimmy's thinking about it. This doesn't seem right to him. And one has to wonder, eventually, if this is intentional on Craig's part. If this is something that Craig knew would bother Jimmy. Um, if he knew the impact that it would have. And we can talk about that more 
when you think about sort of Craig's Endgame and all of this. Um, following that, it says, Craig says, these walls and bars are there for a reason, not to keep us out, but to keep them in. Mankind needs barriers in both cases. Them, Jimmy asks, nature and God. Jimmy says, I didn't think you believe in God, uh, or I thought you didn't believe in God. And Craig says, I don't believe in nature either, uh, or not with a capital N, which seems to indicate some sort of respect. He doesn't feel uh, a sort of reverence for nature. It is there, right? Okay, two more sections for this part, and then I will probably leave the next chunk for the next video lecture. Um, hypothetical, we learn a bunch. We learn maybe a little bit about Craig's jealousy uh, of Jimmy because Jimmy is good with women. Um, he's I mean, it's pretty much the only thing that we know of that he seems to have any skill at other than um, making people laugh and gathering these circles around himself. Um, we also find out that student services at Watson Crick will go and get prostitutes for the students um, as a way to sort of allow them to focus more directly on their schoolwork, which is a fascinating sort of idea that um, it completely separates romance from the individual, and they're just these minds, just these very intelligent students. Um, we get the fridge magnet collection. This first time, I don't know that there's a whole lot about it. Uh, no brain, no pain, uh, siliconsciousness. I mean, these are sort of like cute little things about what they do at Watson Crick, which is, uh, you know, creating things. Um, the boys fall in kind of their old, same old thing. And then on page 210, we have the discussion of illness. And this, I think, is a huge clue as to what's going on in this book as well. So we've seen disease previously, and the security at most of the compounds seems to prevent disease. And Jimmy's mother herself worked on protecting cells from disease. Um, we saw in the early chapters when Jimmy was still very young, uh, pigoons getting burned to prevent disease. Here we get uh, Craig proposing a hypothetical, which is that um, essentially these companies like Healthwiser are creating diseases in order to offer cures. Um, so it's a very sort of insidious and mean idea that goes back to what we talked about with the Heinz dilemma, which is um, this sort of monetizing the cure. And if you can cure a bunch of things at some point, you need either more people or you need more diseases. And one way to accomplish this is to engineer the diseases and then simultaneously engineer the cures. He contends, Craig that is, that his father knew about this and that's why he was killed, right? Um, and he knows it's some sort of whistleblowing, right? So it says, um, <clears throat> on 2.12, uh, are you going paranoid or what, Jimmy says? Not in the least, said Craig. This is the bare naked truth. I hacked into my dad's emails before they deep cleansed his computer. The evidence he'd been collecting was all there the tests he'd been running on the vitamin pills, everything. Of course, those vitamin pills he's talking about are the, the vitamin pills, Craig explains, are disseminating the diseases. So um, the, the way that it works is Healthwiser would, the secret unit at Healthwiser would come up with a disease, they would put it into a vitamin pill, the vitamin pill would go out, um, and people would get sick and spread from there. They didn't need to put it into all the vitamin pills, because that would be too easy to track. So you only put it into a handful of vitamin pills, boom, it goes out, and then people moving around, just as people normally do, spreads the virus. All right, so let's stop there. Um, I'll end this longer lecture, and then um, we'll, we'll come back and we'll talk about uh, chapter nine and chapter 10.